Testing one, two, three. Good. Thank you, Isha, for playing that music. Praise the Most High Yah. <clears throat> Let us have a word of prayer and begin where we left off. Heavenly Father, please continue to guide and direct our paths that your name would be uplifted and honored in this study. In the name of Messiah, Yahweh Shai, we pray. Amen. Okay, let's, um, again, we're looking at uh, Zechariah chapter six, but we're just doing some backdrop. Um, since there are four chariots with horses in Zechariah chapter six, we wanted to compare the four, the four horses of Revelation chapter uh, six as well. And then we had to, in doing that, look at the four assemblies or the four churches of Revelation chapter two. So let's just quickly review, go back into Revelation six very quickly and just look at these four horses and understand what they represented as we go into Zechariah chapter six. Revelation chapter six, let's read from verse one down to verse eight. Revelation chapter six from verse one to verse eight. <clears throat> and I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals and I heard as it were the noise of thunder and one of the four beasts saying, come and see. And I saw and behold a white horse and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard, <clears throat> excuse me, the third beast say, come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard the voice of the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. And I looked and behold, a pale horse and, him that, and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him. And power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. So let's, let's review. The white horse, purity, righteousness, truth, power, right? It's for the Father's spirit, that's the white horse. The second horse, the red horse, taking peace from the earth, killing with a great sword, bloodshed, red horse. Third horse, black horse, compromise and spiritual darkness. Compromise and spiritual darkness. An emphasis on money. An emphasis on money. The fourth beast, the continuation and development of the spiritual darkness in death and hell. Religious persecution against the truth from the power of paganism. Okay, everybody got all that so far? Okay, from the power of paganism. So now, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna, we're not finished uh, with all the scriptures we need to go over, but I'm gonna go back into Zechariah chapter six. Now, this time though, as you recall the first time, we just read part of it. We're gonna read the whole chapter this time. It's not that long. We're gonna read the whole chapter. We're gonna go back through the horses. We're gonna see the entirety of the chapter just to have, you know, that digested. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we'll go into more detail in terms of its interpretation. So let's look at Zechariah chapter six again. And now it's it's 15 verses. So Isha, let's take it five verses at a time just for easy, easily divisible. So let's go from verse one to five. Then we'll go from verse six through uh, 10. And then we'll go from verse 11 to 15. Okay, so one to five. And I turned and lifted up my eyes and looked and behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains and the mountains were mountains of brass. In the first chariot were red horses and in the second chariot, black horses and in the third chariot, white horses and in the fourth chariot, grizzled and bay horses. Then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, what are these my master? And the angel answered and said unto me, 
These are the four spirits of the heavens, which go forth from standing before the master of all the earth. Okay, so uh, we have four horses. We have a, a red, black, white, and a grizzle and bay mixture. Okay, grizzle and, gr and bay mixture. Okay, let's go from verse 6 down to verse 10. Zechariah chapter 6, from 6 to 10. The black horses, which are therein, go forth into the north country, and the white go after them, and the grizzle go forth toward the south country, and the bay went forth and sought to go that they might walk to and fro through the earth. And he said, get you hence, walk to and fro through the earth. So they walked to and fro through the earth. Then cried he upon me and spake unto me, saying, behold, these that go toward the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. And the word of Yahweh came unto me, saying, Take of them of the captivity, even Heldai of Tabiah and Yadayah, which are come from Babylon, and come thou the same day and go into the house of Jasla, the son of Zephaniah. Okay, that's 6 through 10. So he's taking some people from Babylon. And he's, and, he, and he's using them as an object lesson, okay? Some people that were in captive in Babylon, okay? From verses 11 through 15. Then take silver and gold and make crowns and set them upon the head of Joshua, the son of Yahweh Sadak, the high priest, and speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh Yahweh of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of Yahweh. Even he shall build the temple of Yahweh, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both, and the crowns shall be to Halem, and to Tabayah, and to Yadayah, and to Han, the son of Zephaniah, in for a memorial in the temple of Yahweh. And they that are far off shall come and build in the temple of Yahweh. And ye shall know that Yahweh of hosts have sent me unto you, and that this, and this shall come to pass if ye will diligently obey the voice of Yahweh your Most High. There's a lot here. But what we are seeing here at the end, I think it's pretty obvious, is the establishment of Messiah's kingdom. Notice it said, the branch shall grow up out of his place, he shall build the temple of Yahweh. He shall be both a king and a priest. Only Messiah is king and priest. In the Bible, the kings and priests were separated. If ever a king tried to usurp the authority of a priest, he would be punished. And of course, never did a priest try to usurp the authority of a king, for surely he would be put to death. So the priesthood and the king were separated. Only in Messiah does priest and king come together. That's why I said the council of peace shall be between them both. That is between the priesthood and the royal monarch is the same person, Messiah. Everybody got that so far? So you have priesthood and king, the monarch coming together. And that makes the kingdom of Yahweh. That's the kingdom of the Messiah. And he said, this will come to pass if you obey the voice of Yahweh, your most high. So this is also, again, a, a, a symbol of the awakening. Because he said, if we awake, when we awaken, we see these things. As remember, we read this morning, it shall come to pass when all these things come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations with Yahweh thy most high have scattered thee, and shalt return unto Yahweh thy most high, and shalt obey his voice. So the, the, the awakening is marked by a return to obedience, and that brings us into Messiah's kingdom. So whatever happened, listen carefully, whatever happened with the horses, the chariots. It was a sign that led to the establishment of Messiah's kingdom. I want to say that again. Is okay. So the four horses that we saw earlier in this chapter, whatever they were symbolizing, which we're going to talk about, it led to the establishment of Messiah's kingdom. Okay, it leads to the establishment of Messiah's kingdom. Okay. Okay. So let's look at the four horses now in Zechariah. So the first horse was red. 
Now, I want you to notice about the first horse, Zechariah chapter 6 and verse 2. The first In the first chariot were red horses. Now, in this red horses in the first chariot, it did not tell you what direction they were going in. The rest of the horses, it, they had directions. This one didn't have any direction. It didn't say anything about directions that this horse was going to go. But they were red. Okay? And what did we find out about red? It means bloodshed. It means death. It means taking peace away from people. Okay? So the first horse sent to the whole earth. It wasn't any particular direction. It was to the whole earth. It was red, which means death which means judgment, because we're talking about the establishment of the Messiah's kingdom. There's red, there's judgment, okay? Second, black horses. Black horses in the second. Spiritual darkness. And it said the black horse and the white horse, white horse purity and spiritual righteousness and truth and holiness, notice it said about them, it said about them the, in verse six, the black horses which are there in go forth into the north country and the white horse goeth after them. What do you know about the north, the north country? What do you know in terms of when the Bible talks about the north? What do you get? What do you get from the north? What happened? What, 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 why? Why is there judgment in the north? That's true. But what, why? Right? Rome comes out the north. So in other words, Joel, for example, tells us that we have been attacked and we've been, and in fact, the Bible tells us in Jeremiah also, we're taken into captivity by countries representing the north. Right? Isn't that right? So the sons of Yafet take the sons of Yah into captivity from the north. Rome come from the north. The Greeks came out the north, right? Even, even the Medes uh, uh, come out the north with the Persians. So the north represents the oppressor coming and punishing Yah's people and taking them into captivity. So he said the black horse goes into the north. Spiritual darkness goes into the north where the people of Yah have been taken into captivity and is followed by <coughs> a white horse. The white horse is the power of Yah's spirit awakening the people that have been taken into captivity. The people that have been taken into a land where money is the is supreme, right? Money is supreme and Jezebel reigns, right? And they're in spiritual darkness, a white horse comes behind them. A white horse conquering and to conquer. A white horse is the spirit of the father bringing the truth to the people that were in captivity in the black horse. Does that make sense? Testing one, two, three. Okay, so there's a deliverance of the people that were, the Yah's people taking the north. But now, here comes a very interesting part. The grizzle and bay horse. Look up, when you get a chance, look up the word grizzle in your Hebrew concordance. It's 1261 in your Hebrew concordance. 1261 is the word grizzle. And the root word comes from 1259. Do you know what 1259 is? 1259 is hailstones. 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 You know, like hail that looks like snow or like, or like rocks fall. Yeah, hailstone. So the word grizzle is really hail for hailstone. Okay? So where do we see hailstones? in the Bible. And what does it have to do with this? Yes, but there's a place before, it's also, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you this, way before Revelation, you see it way before Revelation, way before Revelation. It's in Genesis, that's right, hail, hail, that's right, hail's in Genesis. What happened, Black Judah? Hail was the most high, one of the most high's judgment on Egypt, that's right. Now, wait a minute, Let's look at Psalm 18. Psalm 18. That's right. Let's look at Psalm 18 and let's see the, the, the setting for where the hailstones come in. Let's see the setting by which the Most High will send hailstones. Now, brother said it perfectly when he talked about Egypt because that was a, a plague on Egypt, the hailstone, right? That destroyed their crops and stuff. Their barley crop was destroyed by the hailstone. Notice it was the barley crop, right? Destroyed by the hailstone. Okay, so look. Let's look at Psalm 18, I'm going to read from verse 6 of Psalm 18 down to verse 19. Actually, 
verse 17 will do. From verse 6 to verse 17, watch this narrative. Watch this context of the hailstone. Okay, watch this. In my distress, I called upon Yahweh and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even into his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his, his secret place his pavilion round about him were thick waters and the thick clouds of the skies. At the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed, hailstones and coals of fire. Yahweh also thundered in the heavens and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them, and he shot out lightnings and discomfited them. Then the channels of the waters were seen, and the foundations of the world were discovered at thy rebuke, O Yahweh, at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils. He sent from above, he took me and drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them which hated me for they were too strong for me. What happened here? The brother was in distress. He called on the Most High. The Most High answered him personally with hailstones and coals of fire, judgment on those that hated the brother. And he delivered him from his strong enemy. Amen. Are you following that? Everybody see that? So the hailstones and coals of fire represent, just like it did in Genesis, the Most High responded. Remember what he said in Genesis? He said, I've heard the cry of my people and I'm come down to deliver them. And part of that deliverance was hailstones and coals of fire. Isn't that right? And so here you have the deliverance. And so now we go back to Zechariah, that grizzle horse is a representation of hailstones and coals. In other words, deliverance from north to south. Wait a minute. Not only that, the bay horse, the bay horse, bay represents strength and power. That's what it means. When you look that up, it's power and strength. It's the only time in the Bible it's used in this context, power and strength, the bay horse. No, it's not true. It was also used um, with, with Jacob, with his bay and speckled, Sheep that he was getting, but it represents power. So the grizzle horse represents Yah delivering his people with him, with his voice and with power. And he noticed that he said that the, the bay horse went to and fro throughout the earth. In other words, the deliverance is north, south, east, and west. Now, wait a minute. We're not finished yet. Let's go to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. Now in Daniel 11, <clears throat> it goes through the history and development also of Rome. And then it goes into the development of pagan papal Rome, which is the Catholic Church. And in that development, it ends up calling pagan, uh, papal Rome the king of the north. The king of the north. Okay? So... Papal Rome, the Catholic Church, is the king of the north. Let me give you some, let me give you a little bit of backdrop too before we go into this any further. Today, the pagan papal church is the key, is the king of all Christianity and all false religion. Y'all understand that, right? The, pag the Catholic Church with its Pope, it, it, it's all of its daughters are all Christianity, all the other religions, including Islam. Islam is a daughter of Rome, as well as all the other religions. Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, Rome controls all of those. You got me so far, okay? The only thing Rome does not control is Yah's true people that are awakened. He, they cannot control them, just like Balaam cannot control uh, the Israelites, okay? Only way they can get us is if we do like Balaam did and compromise ourselves. But 
As long as we're faithful to the Most High, He does not control us. They can infiltrate all they want. The Spirit of Yah will always reveal to us who the traitors are, always, just like it did Hananias and Sapphira. We'll always reveal who the traitors are. They won't be able to get over when the Spirit of Yah is heavy upon us, okay? So that being said, though, Rome has all of his daughters. Now, let me ask you a question. Since Rome started all of these different religions and controls them, which one of those religions has been the most rebellious against her mother? Which one of the religions of Rome would you say has been the most rebellious against her mother? That's right. Islam. Very good. Islam. And how is that rebellion manifest? In the development of the Ottoman Empire. Go look up the Ottoman Empire when you get a chance. It's now what we call Turkey. Turkey became the, uh, the central centerpiece of uh, the Ottoman Empire, which stretched Islam from Turkey all through the now Middle East, all into Africa, first starting in North Africa, but it went all the way into West Africa, where our brothers, where our fathers were when they escaped from Rome. So that's, and our fathers were brought unto subjection. If we're not by, by Christianity, it was by Islam. Always to the point, almost to the point that they had us so hemmed in that our brother Malcolm X looking for an escape from white Jesus, what he do? He went right to Islam. He went right to Islam. But he didn't know any better. You understand? He went right from one, he went from the fire pan into the fire, not realizing Islam enslaved us just as much as white Jesus did. Okay, and to this day in Saudi Arabia and other countries, they're hurting us, our people. To this day. Okay, to this day. So that being the case, Rome being a vindictive and evil kingdom that it is, it will never forget when you do them wrong. There's no forgiveness with Rome. So that is why you are seeing now drone strikes, right? They used to just drop, they used to just drop bombs on with pilots back in the early 90s, but then they developed the drones. And now you got drone strikes. And the drone strikes are striking men, women, and children. And what do all those men, women, and children have in common? They all are Islamic. Men, women, and children by the tens of thousands being killed by drone strikes. Okay? That is Rome spanking Islam. And we're going to see it here. Daniel chapter 11 shows it to us. Let's look at Daniel chapter 11. Now remember, the king of the north is Rome. The king of the south is Islam. So let's take a look at this. Daniel chapter 11, beginning at verse 39 and going down to verse 41. Actually, verse 42. From 39 to 42, Daniel chapter 11, from 39 to 42. Notice what it says here. This, thus shall he do in the most strongholds in a strange, with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. The strange gods is the institutions of Christianity. Okay. And of what we call, they call the church. And at that time, and at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, with horsemen, with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. So he's going to control the Hamites. He's going to control the Islam, but he's going to have to come at them with heavy artillery. Isn't that what they're doing now? Are they not attacking all the Islamic countries with heavy artillery? Yes, they are. Serious artillery. Okay. And they're doing it not only because now the Americans, the Caucasians that are running America, they're doing it for money, right? What do they get? They're trying to get oil. They're trying to get oil and gas. That's what they're doing. They're trying to get oil and gas and get paid. But that ain't, the Pope don't care about oil and gas. He wants them to spank them people because of the Ottoman Empire. He has never, Rome has never forgiven and never will forgive what they did in terms of their attack on Rome, because that's what happened. The Islamic people attacked the Roman Empire, or the Pope's Empire attacked, attacked uh, France and attacked uh, Rome and, and attacked, and that's why you had Turkey is the, actually the, the bottom part of Europe, because it fought its way there and took it. Okay, so now that's, that's how you got the king of the south. Now, 
back to Zechariah. So that grizzled and bay horse went into the south. Huh? The grizzled and bay horse, the, the grizzled part went into the south. Remember that? Let's look at it. Zechariah chapter 6. Let's go back to Zechariah chapter 6. Zechariah 6. And let's see. Verse 6 and 7. Let's read it again. Actually, verse 6 and 7. Yeah. Verse 6, 7, and 8. Verse 6, 7, and 8. The black horses which are therein go forth into the north country, and the white go forth after them, and the grizzle go forth toward the south country. And the bay went forth and sought to go that they might walk to and fro through the earth. And he said, get you hence, walk to and fro through the earth. So they walked to and fro through the earth. Then cried he unto me and spake, saying, unto me, saying, Behold, these that go toward the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. So the black horse went to the north, spiritual darkness, his people in chains. The white horse followed them, an awakening followed by a deliverance. The deliverance continues with the grizzle horse, hailstones and coals of fire among those places where his people are in distress. I'm not saying all Muslims are his people, but his people are among them. You follow me? Testing one, two, three. I'm not saying all Muslims are his people, but his people are among them. Just like Malcolm X was a Muslim and he was one of the most high chosen, but he was did not understand where he, who, what he was doing in terms of worshiping the same religion that Rome started with Christianity. Didn't understand. But nevertheless, he was in ignorance, one of the chosen people. And remember, I will lay upon you no other burden. See? So now you got people that are in Muslim nations, both in Africa and in the Middle East, but especially in Africa, but there's chosen there that are in this religion. They're going to be delivered. They're in distress because they get smacked around just like we do in the United States. And even worse, they get smacked around. And so they're going to be in distress. The Most High is going to hear their cry and deliver them. So you got deliverance from the north. You got deliverance from the south. And then the bay horses, the strength is going to and fro throughout the earth. This is all representation of Yah's spirit going to and fro throughout the earth for the awakening and deliverance of his people. What is the, the final straw is? The branch establishes his temple. That's a sign of the establishment of the kingdom. The temple is a sign of the establishment of the kingdom. And you remember what the Messiah said to his disciples. We studied it last week. Thou art Peter, but upon this rock, that is Messiah, I will build my church, my assembly, my nation, my temple. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, meaning I'm going to go on the attack and they will not win. You hear what I'm saying? Yah's son is going to go on the attack. Because why? Because in righteousness, he does judge and make war. And he's going to deliver his people. Let me show you this. Watch this. Now, remember, we talked about this uh, a few weeks ago, how Messiah said in Revelation chapter 3 that he was going to get a new name. And, 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 and the new name was already shown us, but we just didn't recognize it. Remember, the new name was already shown to us. We just didn't recognize it. And, and you're going to see it right here again. Remember that? I'm going, before I get there, let me ask you, where is it? Where is the new name written? Can somebody tell me? The new name is in, uh, is in the prophets. He's already shown us the new name that he's going to have in heaven. See, his name now is Yahweh Shah. Yah exists to say it, but his name is going to be different when we get to heaven. What is his name going to be? Y'all should know. We studied it. What prophet is it in? Y'all remember? All right, I'm testing you. That was a hard question, but now you're going to know, okay? So let's take a look at it. Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah 23. And I'm going to start at verse 3. And we're going to go, we're going to stop at verse 6 temporarily. And we're going to continue on from there for a minute. But from verse 3 to verse 6, Jeremiah chapter 23. Watch carefully now. The new name is written here. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. See, that's gathering the remnant out of all countries where he delivered them, where he, did, where he drove us, right? And bringing us together. This is future. This is not now, because we haven't been gathered together now, right? So this is future. 
and I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith Yahweh. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. That hasn't happened yet. This is future. A king shall reign. He shall reign from Judah. What's his name? And in his days, Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called. Yahweh, our righteousness. That's exactly right. Yahweh, our righteousness. Yahweh, Sadak. Yahweh, Sadak. That's his name. So now we already know what his name is going to be. That's his new name. And remember what he said. He said about the church of Philadelphia, I'm going to ride upon you my new name. Remember he said that? He said, I'm going to write upon you the name of my father, the name of the city of my father, which is New Jerusalem, and I'm going to write upon you, what did he say? My new name. Philadelphia is a representation of the 144,000. Philadelphia is, so I'm writing upon you, Yahweh, our righteousness. And again, brothers and sisters, I want to stress to you, what is the most important doctrine right now that we're, that's preparing us for the kingdom? Justification by faith, which is a representation of what? Yahweh, our righteousness. You catching that? You catching that? That's his new name. And this is the, so Zechariah 6 is showing the, 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 the deliverance of a people that's been distressed, that cries out to the Father, the deliverance in the north, where we were first taken by those peoples of Japheth, the deliverance of the south, where the Islamic people oppressed us, and then east and west and all over the earth with the bay with power, deliverance of hailstones and coals of fire, deliverance with the power of Yahweh, our righteousness, the white horse. Everybody with me so far? Everybody with me so far? We're not finished here in Jeremiah yet, though. This is the, okay, we're not finished yet. Because verses, we're going to read verse 7, verse 7 and 8. Because that's going to show us the four horses we just read in Zechariah. Verse 7 and 8 is going to confirm that. Notice verse 7 and 8 of Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 7 and 8. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that they shall no more say, Yahweh liveth, which brought up the children of Israel are the land of Egypt. But Yahweh liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country and from all the countries whither I had driven them and they shall dwell in their own land. Huh? Yeah. Wait a minute. So they celebrate the Passover because of the deliverance from Mizraim from Egypt. But he said, you're not going to worry about that no more. You're going to say now, Yahweh liveth, which delivered us from the north, the south, the east, and the west, from all the places that we have been driven, and we want to dwell in our own land. Let's go back now to Zechariah chapter 6. You see how you see how we had to go through all of that just to get to this point? Because there's so much that's so it's so deep. So deep. Zechariah chapter 6. Now, after the, after the four chariots do their work, the result of that, which represents judgment, it represents deliverance. Huh? That's what the, that's what them chariots represent. Judgment on the heathen and deliverance. Now you know why the fourth horse of Revelation is not represented here in Zechariah because that's the pale horse. That's from paganism. This is deliverance and destruction to paganism and deliverance to the people of the Most High, and the establishment of Yah's kingdom. Everybody got me? You following what I'm saying? So that so the establishment of Yah's kingdom, that, that pale horse won't ever come back. That's the beast and his false prophet that's going to attempt to fight against Messiah. But the gates of hell shall not prevail. They shall not prevail. Amen. He's coming in righteousness to, 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 to judge and make war. To judge and make war. And he said, let's read those last words of Zechariah 6 again. Let's read them again. Zechariah chapter 6, because this is what we're talking about from verse, from verse 11. <laughs> and, you know, Jehoshua, which is Joshua, the son of Yahweh, our righteousness, or Yahweh's righteousness. Jehoshua, the son of Yahweh's righteousness. Joshua, the son of Yahweh, Sadat. Powerful. Uh, Zechariah chapter 6 from verse 11 to verse 15. Take silver and gold and make crowns. See, the redeemed are always, uh, one of the ways they are signified is by crowns. 
coming on, being put on our heads. Crowns of victory and crowns come to people that rule, don't they? So the Israelite is going to rule this planet. There's going to be other nations. Oh, yes. There's going to be other nations of redeemed people, but the Israelites are going to rule this planet. Okay? Notice, take then take silver and gold and make crowns and set them upon the head of Joshua, the son of Yahweh Sadat, the high priest. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh Yahweh of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, that is Messiah, he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of Yahweh. That's the same thing what he said in Matthew. Upon this rock, I'm going to build my assembly, my nation, my church, right? And the gates of hell shall not prevail. He shall build the temple of Yahweh. Even he shall build the temple of Yahweh, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne. So, he, and, and and he shall be a priest upon his throne. That's a very important because, like I said, you don't ever see priest and king in the same thing. It's only Messiah that's priest and king. That's what makes him special above all. That's why some people say, well, he was just a prophet. No, he wasn't no, just no prophet. You don't call one who is a priest and a king just a prophet. I'm sorry. I mean, when that's an offense, you know, Muslims think they're doing me a favor and they say, oh, I believe Jesus. Yeah, he was a he was a prophet. No, he wasn't no prophet and neither was Muhammad. You know, Messiah is king and priest. King and priest. Prophet, keep priest and king. And the council of peace shall be between them both. And the crowns shall be to Halem and to Tobiah and to Jadayah and Han, the son of Zephaniah, for a memorial in the temple of Yahweh. That's in the kingdom. And they that are far off shall come and build in the temple of Yahweh. And ye shall know that Yahweh of hosts have sent me unto you. And this shall come to pass if ye will diligently obey the voice of Yahweh, your most high. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and enter in through the gates into the city. Isn't that what he said? Yeah, yeah. So he said, when we turn, return and obey. And that's what the awakening is all about. That's what that white horse is all about. That's what that grizzled and bay horses are all about. The red ones are destruction to the wicked. It's the deliverance. It's the hailstones and coals of fire. That's going to be our deliverance. When we cry to the Most High. Notice it said, in my distress, I cry. And at the end he said, and he delivered me. Brothers and sisters, you want to know why? You know, we allow people are being allowed to shoot brothers in their apartments while they're eating ice cream and shoot them in the street when their hands are up and only get 10 years in prison. And then how how white Jesus causing us to stroke the hair, the ones that are killing us. Huh? You, you want to know? You want to know why that is? Because he's waiting for us to get so distressed. So distressed that we, and we realize marching on Washington ain't going to get nothing done for us. When we realize these elite liberals and these redneck conservatives both hate us. When we realize nobody on this earth is going to deliver us, but our God. When we realize that and we turn to him and start to obey him, he's going to deliver us. And brothers and sisters, it's not an if. It's a win because it's going to happen because he's already spoken it, right? So the only question is who's going to be involved in the new kingdom? Those that are, are repentant, those that are seeking the Father's glory, those that are seeking his spirit to walk in it and to live in it, and through that bring obedience and be cleansed from all iniquity, right? He knows them that are his. Let those that name the name of Messiah depart from iniquity. That's right. That's right. If my people who are called by my name shall hum See, brothers and sisters, we're not waiting for the repentance of Germans. He's not waiting for the repentance of, of Dutch people. He's not waiting for the repentance of Romanians. He's waiting for the repentance of Judah and Israel who are represented by them people that were brought in chains and even today being shot down in the street. He waiting for that. And he's allowing this distress to come upon us until we look up. See, what happened now? People go and get distressed and what do they do? They go to some church, to some pastor, some cross on the church, some Christianity. You running from the fire pan to the fire, right? You running from your distress to white Jesus. You running right to Rome. That ain't the place for us. Or you running, you putting your little beanie on and you going to a mosque. That ain't going to help us. 
We got a God of a nation. He made covenant with us. And he want us to return to him. And this in chapter six is going to come to pass. It's going, in fact, it's already happened. We already, the black horse, I think we can agree. The black horse has already arrived. The red horse has already arrived. And now the white horse is coming. That's the awakening. Huh? The white horse come. That's the awakening. That's where we at right now. See, it's coming, brothers and sisters. In every page that we study of this Bible, when we look in that prophecy, you can see in all the prophecies, whether we study in Ezekiel or whether we study in Jeremiah or whether we study in Zechariah or Revelation, you can see it's all showing us. It's very close. It's coming. And the only question is we should just be getting ourselves prepared. That's the only thing. We need to be getting ourselves <coughs> prepared because it's coming. It's surely coming, okay? He's waiting for us to look up, look up, look to him, not to wooden crosses or stones in the middle of uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. He, he's telling us to look up to him, look to him, and he will deliver his people. Because when you look at him, you're saying, you are my God, and then he's going to look down and say, okay, you're my people. Praise y'all. Let's have a word of prayer. Most high, how we're again very thankful and very grateful for your mercy and truth toward us. We ask that you continue to guide and direct our paths. And if ever we go off the, the way of truth and righteousness, we ask that you be faithful to show us the way we should go by your spirit. In the name of the Messiah, how shall we pray? Amen. Praise the most high, yeah. Amen.